Hello friends, I am Dr. V.C. Manoj, President of National Neontology Forum Kerala and Chairman of Organizing Team IAP Neocon 2021. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the second webinar in our fortnightly series, Learn from the Legends. We are honored to have today with us Professor Dr. Peter Davis, one of the living legends of neonatology, who will talk to us about delivery room management, evidence base and future perspectives. Welcome, sir. Let me also welcome the moderators for today's session. Dr. PMC Nair and Dr. Arvind Shanai from uh, Bangalore. Before I hand over the floor to the moderators, may I also welcome each and every one of you. Friends, we are truly humbled by your presence. In fact, we are thrilled to have more than 2,000 registrations as of now from 36 countries for this series, including the 500 registrations that came in the last 24 hours. For the kind attention of those who are attending this session live from a YouTube channel, arrangements have been made for transferring your questions posted in the YouTube channel live to the faculty and moderators for discussion at the end. Thank you, friends for having joined the webinar series, which will run in the next 15 months as a curtain raiser for our national conference, IAP Neocon, scheduled in September 2021. We hope you find all our sessions productive and useful in day-to-day -day practice of neonatology. May I now request Dr. PMC Nair and Dr. Aravind Shanai to kindly take over, introduce our speaker, and moderate today's session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Am, am I audible? Okay. Yes, good, yes, afternoon, yes. good afternoon and good evening. It must be 8.30 p.m. in Australia now. A warm welcome to all of you. Let me first of all thank Dr. Manoj and his team of Kerala NNF and IAP Neonatology chapter for bestowing this opportunity on me to moderate the talk of none other than the great legendary Professor Peter Graham Davis, Director of Neonatal Medicine, Royal Women's Hospital, Melbourne, Australia. I have a special bond with Australia as I had my first intensive care training in Westmead Hospital, Sydney, Australia under Dr. Elizabeth John. Now coming to the topic, the first 60 seconds after birth is probably the most enigmatic, exciting and complicated experience in the entire life of a human being. From a water-filled environment to an air-breathing life, so many changes are taking place immediately after birth. So as the saying goes, let us hear straight from the horse's mouth regarding delivery room management, evidence and future perspectives, especially regarding delayed cord clamping, sustained lung inflation, delivery room CPAP, etc. And uh, with this short introduction, I think I now hand over to my colleague and co-moderator, Dr. Arvind Shenoy, to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nair, and welcome everybody. At the outset, I must thank Professor Manoj and the wonderful team of uh, IAP NeoChap as well as NNF Kerala for having organized this. Without much ado, I think we must introduce the star of today's show. Professor Peter Davis is Professor Director of Neonatal Medicine at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne. He has led the Department of Newborn Research since 2009. He completed his MBBS at the University of Queensland in 1982 and underwent basic pediatric training in Brisbane. He completed his neonatal fellowship training in McMaster University, Canada, where he developed an interest in clinical epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. For those of you who don't know, Professor Owen Bhakku from Chandigarh also trained at this same center. After returning to Australia in 1993, Professor B Peter Davis, uh, was appointed as a neonatologist at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne, and his interest in non-invasive ventilation is well known and led to an MD through the University of Melbourne in 1998. He leads a team of enthusiastic clinical researchers interested in improving the care of babies in the delivery room and in the intensive care unit. He is a substantial contributor to the Cochrane Collaboration and a member of the neonatal subcommittee of the ILCOR, International Liaison Committee on Research Station. Support for his research comes from the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council through a practitioner fellowship, a program grant, and a center for research excellence grant. 
this in brief would be his introduction. His actual CV would be much, much longer and would probably take up the rest of the talk. But instead of going through that, I would request Professor Peter Davis and present him to all of you. Professor Davis, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shinoi and uh, Dr. Nayar. And thank you very much to Dr. Man Manoj for organizing this series. It's a great honor to, uh, to join you tonight, uh, as I do, live from the MCG, as you can, as you can see. So tonight we're going to uh, be talking about some recent developments in neonatal resuscitation. And what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight might not actually influence your care in the delivery room tomorrow, but I hope it will help you understand some of the basic processes going on uh, as the fetus makes the transition to the newborn, particularly as it relates to um, the aeration of the lungs and the changes in circulation that follow cord clamping. So we're discussing physiology and we usually subdivide that into the physiology of the cardiovascular system and the physiology of the respiratory system. But today I'd like to bring these two together because I think there is a lot of interaction between the two and how one influences the other is very important and influences the way we should be managing these uh, newborn babies. One of the key topics we're going to talk about is cord clamping and the move to delayed, or as one of my colleagues likes to refer to it as deferred cord clamping. And I'd like to convince you that it's more than just a placental transfusion that we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about delayed cord clamping. For some time, we've all been practicing delayed cord clamping. This recommendation came uh, from the ILCOR group in 2010. Uh, and for term babies, since that time, at least, we've been delaying cord clamping for at least a minute. And that has been seen to be appropriate. It has been widely taken up around the world. But I'd like to start by talking uh, a little bit about cord clamping in preterm um, infants. And this was the result of the literature search that we did as part of the ILCOR group in 2015. At that time, there were 16 articles on the topic, including 12 randomized trials and four observational studies. Not a great number of babies included overall. These are quite small studies individually and even bringing together all of the randomized trials, still less than 700 babies. And most importantly, that these trials mostly excluded any babies who were receiving resuscitation. When we put all of that evidence together, it, it seems that there was no difference in mortality or severe intraventricular hemorrhage, which we might consider to be the most important adverse effects uh, on preterm infants. Uh, there was no evidence at all regarding the long-term neurodevelopment. However, there were some small improvements in any intraventricular hemorrhage, that is anything from grade one through to grade four, and an improvement in hemodynamic stability in the first hours after delivery. So the treatment recommendation at this, uh, at this point was that for preterm babies not requiring immediate resuscitation, um, we suggest delaying cord clamping. Now this is uh, a special sort of language developed by ILCOR. And the subtlety here is when we suggest something rather than we recommend something, uh, this is, this is a, um, a much weaker recommendation and it's based on low or very low quality evidence. So it's not something we can be certain of. We must admit that more evidence needs to be acquired here. But for the moment, based on what we know, uh, we suggest that we delay cord clamping for preterm babies. 
In 2017, uh, there was a new large study published, and that was the APT trial from, uh, from Sydney. And that changed considerably the, uh, the, um, the amount of evidence and the direction of evidence in this particular topic. It almost doubled the number of babies that were uh, available for inclusion in this meta-analysis. So we now have almost 3,000 babies and uh, about half of them contributed by this last study. And so when we pool all of the results of this uh, of studies on this topic and we're looking at the outcome of mortality, we see that delaying cord clamping reduces neonatal mortality. The relative risk is 0.68. The black diamond at the bottom of the pooled analysis does not cross the line of one. So this is a statistically significant result. So this uh, means that we treat 33 babies to prevent one death. And if we apply that to babies or preterm babies born around the world, that is a clinically important uh, uh, effect. The other thing we always need to pay attention to in a pooled analysis or a meta-analysis is this I-squared statistic that tells us about the consistency between all of the studies that have been included in the meta-analysis. And the I-squared of zero means these results are very consistent from study to study. Now, uh, just to, to talk about or to revise perhaps some, some of our understanding of, of the circulation as it transitions from the fetus to the adult pattern in the, uh, in the minutes following birth. So if we start with the, the mature circulation, and as you all know, blood circulates back from the body, the upper and lower body to the right side of the heart where it's pumped to the lungs and then to the left heart and then oxygenated blood pumped to the body. So this is uh, an example of the heart beating in series, the two sides of the heart beating in series. The fetus, of course, has a placenta and blood comes from the, from the placenta, oxygenated through the ductus venosus, through the foramen ovale to reach the left heart and then uh, is pumped to the body. Any blood that finds its way to the right heart is mostly shunted across through the ductus arteriosus uh, and joins blood going down to the lower body and the placenta to be reoxygenated. There is very little blood flow, as you know, to the lungs, uh, and that's how it how it should be in in utero when the um, when the lungs are not being used for gas exchange. So in the adult um, circulation, the left ventricular preload, the blood that fills the left the left ventricle and is then pumped to the body, comes from the lungs through the pulmonary veins. From the fetus, the, uh, the left, ventricular, left ventricular preload comes from the umbilical venous return through the ductus venosus and the foramen ovale. And so it's interesting to, um, to note that in both situations, the preload uh, for the left heart derives from the organ of gas exchange in the adult, from the lungs, from the fetus, uh, from the placenta. And if we look at that, uh, what happens after birth, so we start with blood coming, oxygenated blood coming from the placenta and returning to the left heart, any blood coming through the right heart, going through the ductus arteriosus. When we clamp the uh, umbilical cord, we cut off this supply of preload to the left side of the heart. We also, when we cut off the placenta, reduce that low resistance circuit, uh, meaning the pressures on the right on the left side of the circulation go up. So blood, uh, we rely then on the lungs opening up, aerating, um, and the pulmonary vascular resistance falling so that blood can flow from the right heart into the lungs and then go on into the left heart and replace that uh, preload that we used to get from the placenta.
So the cardiovascular effects of umbilical clamping at birth. So after birth, that left ventricular preload must switch from the umbilical vein to the pulmonary veins. And this requires lung aeration and a fall in pulmonary vascular resistance. However, if we clamp the cord before the lung aerates, for instance, if the, if the baby is uh, apneic um, and we want to get the baby quickly to the resuscitation trolley, if we clamp the cord before the lung aerates, there is an immediate reduction in left ventricular preload as well as an increase in left ventricular afterload, causing a decrease in left ventricular output. So in other words, we're making a bad situation worse. And this has led uh, we and other people to consider this concept of perhaps we shouldn't be clamping the cord based on the clock, but we should be thinking about the physiology of the baby and, and clamping the, the uh, the umbilical cord when it's the right time for that particular baby. And that will be after the lung aerates, after the pulmonary blood flow increases, and then we can, cl we can clamp the umbilical cord. At that point, the, the pulmonary blood flow is able to, to take over immediately that role of providing preload for the left ventricle following cord clamping. So then we ask ourselves, well, we think we know what we do for babies who don't require resuscitation, but should we be delaying cord clamping for babies who need some help aerating their lungs for infants receiving resuscitation? I'm going to share, you, share with you a video uh, that demonstrate that at least this is possible. So here we have a, a baby being delivered by cesarean section. We've got the clinical team down at the feet end of the, of the mother. We've got a, a firm base on the mother's leg on which, to, uh, on which to perch the baby. We've got the researcher who's actually measuring the heart rate using echocardiography, although we can do that with ECG. Baby's uh, got a good heart rate and is, is quite uh, vigorous. We position the, the cord so that it's not under any tension and we observe the baby. And in this particular baby, um, suddenly at about a minute of age, the baby became apneic and floppy. And it, the clinicians decided they needed to provide some resuscitation in the form of ventilation. And so they're using a T-piece with a respiratory function monitor between that and the mask, and they're giving pressures of 30 on five delivering a tidal volume of four mils per kilo. Baby's still uh, being perfused with the cord on the umbilical cord. The first couple of ventilations or first couple of inflations, no carbon dioxide, then carbon dioxide appears. Then the baby starts to cry. The heart rate is, is now back up to 140. And finally, about a minute after we've, saw, we've seen evidence that the lungs aerated by the exhaled CO2 appearing, the cord is clamped and the baby wrapped up and taken uh, to, to the resuscitation trolley. So that's delayed cord clamping. Uh, the alternative that uh, some people have proposed to delayed clamping is cord milking or stripping of the umbilical cord. And the, the rationale for doing something like that is that perhaps if we're focusing on transferring blood to the newborn, we could do that quickly by milking the, the umbilical cord and avoid needing to wait for the, uh, wait for the um, delayed cord clamping. So again, when we, we looked at this uh, question for ILCOR, a very limited amount of evidence, just four randomized trials and one cohort study comparing, um, comparing uh, immediate cord clamping with cord milking, none comparing delayed cord clamping with milking. And the consensus on science when we look at that evidence is that there is no difference in the rates of death, no data on neurodevelopment, no difference in the rate of babies needing phototherapy for jaundice and some low quality evidence showing a small reduction 
in rates of all intraventricular hemorrhage. At this point, the ILCOR team came up with a treatment recommendation uh, against the routine use of cord milking for babies born less than 28 weeks and suggested that there were trials underway that would fill this particular evidence gap. In the meantime, we were doing some uh, animal work using a lamb model to see what was actually happening as we milked the cord. Here we have three graphs. The top graph is the net umbilical blood flow. Uh, and you can see that throughout this recording, there are eight episodes of milking of the cord, each at this uh, dotted black line, first milking, second milking, third milking, fourth milking, and so on. Here we've got the, uh, a sensor in place that's measuring carotid artery pressure. And the, finally, on the bottom panel, we've got a, a sensor measuring carotid artery blood flow. And what we can see is that with each milking episode, a jump in carotid artery pressure and a surge in carotid artery flow, which for preterm babies, we think might not be a good thing. It might be setting these babies up for intraventricular hemorrhage. And this compares to uh, a lamb that was resuscitated before cord clamping, where the umbilical um, blood flow normal here is clamped here. And after lung aeration, very little uh, change in either carotid artery pressure or carotid artery flow, a much more stable transition from fetus to newborn circulation. And this has uh, come to be borne out by a, a, a recent human study by Anup Katheria in, in the US who, um, who compared umbilical cord milking with delayed uh, umbilical cord clamping in a cohort of extremely brief preterm babies. And his results were quite uh, informative. His primary outcome was death or severe intraventricular hemorrhage. And the, the rate of, of, of hemorrhage was greater in the, uh, in the babies who had umbilical cord milking, although this was not statistically significant. What was most interesting and perhaps most important was that the rate of severe intraventricular hemorrhage in the most immature babies was substantially higher in those who had had umbilical cord milking, and this was highly statistically significant. Now, the ex external monitoring committee, uh, when they saw these data uh, at an interim analysis, said you should stop recruitment. And the conclusion of these authors was that centres practising milking should consider discontinuing this practice in the most extremely preterm babies. It's going to move now to uh, the question of how we should aerate the lung. And we understand a little bit more now, I think, about the physiology of clearing the lungs of, of fluid. We were taught uh, when we were medical students that this was due to a number of mechanisms and first mentioned was sodium reabsorption and reversal of the osmotic uh, gradient across the epithelium. And so sodium pump would uh, reabsorb sodium, water would follow and the alveoli would be cleared of lung fluid. And that certainly does happen, but it happens at a very slow rate and doesn't really contribute importantly to the uh, immediate transition from a, a fluid filled lung to an air filled lung in the minutes after delivery. The second mechanism is the posture induced increases as in pulmonary pressure during labor, the contractions of the uterus squeezing on the chest and expelling lung fluid. Perhaps more importantly, uh, in those last few pushes as the baby leaves the, the birth canal, um, the scrunching up of the baby, uh, compressing the lungs and gets rid of some fluid. That explains some uh, fluid loss, but the major contributor to clearing the uh, lungs of fluid is due to an increase in transepithelial pressure generated by inspiration. 
and Stuart Hooper has, has given this nice little um, cartoon showing the airways from the trachea through the airways and the alveoli as being filled with fluid at birth. With the initial cries and breaths, that fluid is driven distally into the alveoli and then into the lung, lung tissue. And then finally, over a period of three or four hours, that lung fluid is cleared from the lung and it uh, assumes its more mature form. This led to the question of whether uh, sustained inflations might be a useful manoeuvre to help us, um, to help us uh, establish lung aeration. And the rationale here was that if you could rapidly establish a functional residual capacity, you might improve outcomes following resuscitation. And when Ilkor was looking at the evidence here, there was good evidence again from animals, particularly in lamb and rabbit models, that sustained inflations were safe and effective. And this was a, uh, a recording made in the synchrotron, a special x-ray of a, a rabbit pup getting a sustained inflation. And you can see this long, slow inflation given to the lamb inflates the lungs steadily, gently to full inflation. And then uh, tidal breathing takes over, functional residual capacity is established and the animal is very effectively ventilated. And so this was a very encouraging um, picture, an encouraging concept. And it led to some human randomized trials uh, examining this topic. And at the time we first looked at sustained inflation, there were three small randomized trials and a couple of cohort studies, no evidence of a benefit in terms of the big uh, outcomes like mortality and bronchopulmonary dysplasia, no risk of air leak. There was, however, some low quality evidence of a decreased need for mechanical ventilation. So uh, quite encouraging. However, Ilkor at this time said, we suggest against the routine use of a sustained inflation for preterm infants without, without spontaneous respirations, but maybe think about it in, in special circumstances or research settings. This was a weak recommendation, low quality uh, evidence. And this recommendation was based on uh, the randomized trials that were available at the time, which showed no e evidence of a long-term benefit as well as a lack of clarity on how to administer the sustained inflation, how long to go for, what pressures to use. And it was done at the time when the sale trial was underway. And so I'll, I'll just share with you the, uh, the results of the sale trial, which was published last year. Uh, and one of the important lessons from this study is that we can't always immediately apply the, uh, the results of trials or studies done in animal models. So again, to go over the rationale, if we could commence gas exchange quickly, we might have a more effective resuscitation and better outcomes. The, the physics of fluid filled lungs uh, suggests that these lungs will have longer time constants than gas filled lungs and therefore would need a longer inflation. We've seen it work well in animals with the caveat that these animals were intubated with an endotracheal tube and sedated. There was limited human experimental data and there was the ideal opportunity to run a randomized trial because there was different approaches in different parts of the world. So Europe was using sustained inflations routinely in many countries, but the USA was, was not. Ilcor, as I've said, was sitting on the fence and not really uh, supporting one side or another. So the hypothesis of the sale trial was that in these extremely preterm babies between 23 and 27 weeks who needed positive pressure ventilation, that a sustained inflation of 20 centimetres of water for 15 seconds and then repeated again at a slightly higher level um, compared with standard treatment with intermittent positive pressure ventilation with PEEP uh, would produce better outcomes, and the primary outcome was death or BPD. The sample size calculation uh, to achieve 80% power and a 12.5% reduction in 
death or BPD um, required almost 600 babies. The Americans, of course, were quite nervous about this new treatment and planned some safety analyses throughout the trial with a very experienced uh, external monitoring committee, including Alan Job and John Catwinkle. And after the third safety review, they suggested that we stop the trial because of an increased uh, numbers of deaths in the first 48 hours. As anybody who's ever tried to do uh, research in the delivery room will know, and I know Ola is listening, it is not something for the faint hearted. The consent process is, is very difficult. In the US and the rest of the world, uh, we first approached, um, we tried to approach mothers antenatally who would be eligible. But of course, we can't get to all mothers. Those who come in um, with an abruption and need urgent delivery, we will not be able to approach them. So for many European and Australian centres, it was decided uh, we would allow deferred or retrospective consent uh, for these babies. So they were enrolled and randomised and treated. And then we went back to their parents uh, a day or two later and asked for consent to include their data in the study. These babies you will recognize, I think, uh, um, predominantly white uh, infants, very high rates of antenatal steroids, high rates of cesarean section, roughly equal gender distribution, babies on average around seven, 700, 750 uh, grams, and many of these were the product of multiple pregnancies. About half of the, the babies in, in each group were consented using antenatal consent. The primary outcome of death or BPD showed no statistically significant difference, although the, the control babies did have a lower rate of death or BPD than the sustained inflation babies. Rates of death are slightly lower in the control group, no difference in the rates of BPD but none of these results were statistically significant. Other important uh, outcomes evident in the, in the intensive care unit, no difference in rates of early surfactant uh, use in the delivery room or surfactant use at any time, no significant difference in rates of chest compressions or need for intubation in the delivery room, necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, retinopathy of prematurity or patent ductus arteriosus, the two groups were very similar. With any, uh, with any large randomized trial, it's interesting to look at, at subgroups to see if different groups of babies behaved differently. It did not appear that the consent process had any influence on the results. Boy babies and girl babies uh, performed almost exactly the same. There didn't seem to be any substantial difference between the very, very immature babies and those who were slightly more, uh, more mature, or whether the babies were exposed or not exposed to antenatal steroids. There was a, a, a feeling that perhaps the Europeans who were more familiar with the use of sustained inflation would get a better result than the North Americans, but it didn't turn out that way. The, the results were uniform across all of the centres. Now we'll come to looking at the adverse of events that we were uh, pre-specified to look at in, in this trial. Uh, and the, the result that stopped the trial was this incidence of death in the, first, in the first two days of life. It was substantially higher in the sustained inflation group, 7.4% versus 1.4%, highly statistically significant. Other results are no difference. No difference in rates of intraventricular hemorrhage or pneumothorax, uh, things that you might have expected to have contributed to a, a change in mortality. So no obvious reason why the death rates were different, but they were different, at least in the first 48 hours. So the conclusion of, of, the, uh, of the SAIL trial was that in extremely preterm infants requiring resuscitation at birth, up to two sustained inflations does not reduce the risk of BPD or death, but may increase early mortality. 
So I'm going to finish with uh, a, a little discussion on mask ventilation, some new things we're, we're learning at the moment about mask ventilation, which I think you'll agree is the, the mainstay of, of neonatal resuscitation. We've been interested in uh, measuring what goes on in the delivery room from a respiratory point of view for many years, and we use a, uh, a flow detector placed between the T-piece and the uh, face mask. This is a hot wire anemometer. It measures flow and integrates to give the tidal volumes going into and out of the baby. And so it gives us recordings like this. We can see the pressure um, measured in, in real time. In this case, the pressure is set at 30 on five. Um, and that, that, is, uh, that is fairly standard. But what we also can measure is flow going towards the baby. That's in this green line. Flow above the line is flow going towards the baby. And then expiration below the line, flow coming back away from the infant through that flow detector. That flow can be integrated to give the tidal volume going in, inspiratory tidal volume and expiratory tidal volume. And I've labeled this, this uh, recording as good mask ventilation. So the, the ventilation that goes into the baby comes out of the baby. There's no leak, there's no obstruction. What I wanted to show you now was a, a, a picture that we see not uncommonly of airway obstruction. So here is a baby getting their pressures of 30 on five, but not moving any gas towards the baby and no gas coming back from the baby, no tidal volume being delivered to this baby and therefore uh, an ineffective resuscitation. We see this reasonably commonly if we define uh, airway obstruction as a 75% reduction in expired tidal volume, we were seeing that in about a quarter of our resuscitations and we weren't sure why this was occurring. We, we wondered if we were um, having problems with our neck position, either overextending the neck or having the neck too flexed or pushing the mask onto the face too tight and causing obstruction. But we ha now have a new insight into what's, what's going on with uh, these special images coming from the synchrotron of rabbits in the, uh, these are preterm rabbits in the first seconds of life. And what we can see here is the, the head of the rabbit, the chest of the rabbit, we can see the esophagus, we can see the trachea, and we can see the upper airway. And we can see here that the trachea, and here it is blown up, uh, above the trachea, the glottis is closed. So there is no continuity between the trachea and the upper airway. Here we can see the trachea is open all the way through the epiglottis and into the, uh, into the pharynx. So the airway is open. Here's what happens if you try and bag and mask a, a rabbit with a closed glottis. You can see that the esophagus becomes aerated. We inflate the stomach and we compress the lungs and we don't deliver any gas to, to the lungs. And I think uh, you may recognize this as, as having happened in, in one or two of your resuscitations over the years where you thought you were doing everything right, a baby wasn't responding, but it is probably because the glottis was closed and the breaths you were trying to deliver to the baby's lungs were not getting through. So, the, um, the explanation for this is that it is normal for the glottis and the epiglottis to be mostly closed during fetal life. This uh, establishes an increased pressure of, of fluid inside the lung and that allows for lung growth. Perfectly normal, that's what we were designed to function like. Now these rabbit pups and our very preterm infants we should consider to be fetuses in the outside world. And with the, with the rabbits, once the lung was aerated and once regular respirations were established, the glottis and the epiglottis are mostly open and then mask ventilation will work. What was noticed in the, in the animal lab that were certain factors that made apnea more likely and lead, led to unsuccessful mask ventilation, things like hypoxia, hypothermia, and the placement of a face mask on the, on the rabbit's face. 
And this was taken a step further by uh, a, a Dutch group who reported their observations of what happens when you place a mask on the face of a breathing preterm baby at, at, uh, immediately following delivery. And they looked at more than 400 babies who were less than 32 weeks gestation. Most of those babies, almost all of those babies were breathing before the mask went on, but about a half of them stopped breathing as soon as the mask was applied. They noticed this uh, effect was greater as the infants became more immature. And they postulated that this is likely due to a trigeminal cardiac reflex and the stimulation of the trigeminal nerve, which is sensory to the face, can provoke breath holding or apnea, a reduction of heart rate and changes in blood pressure. So I'm going to draw things to a close now and uh, invite your questions. But in summary, delayed cord clamping is recommended for term and preterm infants. Physiological based cord clamping may be more, even more beneficial. The concept may be able to be applied to neonatal resuscitation and stabilization, particularly in preterm infants and studies are underway to examine that hypothesis. We would suggest that cord milking is not recommended for extremely preterm infants. Sustained inflations are not the answer to errating the preterm lap the preterm lung, we can understand the physiology, we can understand the animal, um, the animal exper experience, but it, in, uh, in preterm infants with the sustained inflation delivered by a mask, this did not have a beneficial effect. And we know that airway obstruction is a common cause of ineffective ventilation and obstruction occurs at the level of the glottis and the epiglottis. So I will leave you there with a, uh, a, a picture of uh, summertime in Australia. And thank you for your attention. Thank you once again to the organisers. And uh, I'll hand over to our chairs for questions. Thank you very much. I think I am audible now. And thank you, Professor uh, Peter David, for a wonderful discussion and presentation of your research work. Now, uh, there are two questions regarding sustained infl uh, lung inflation. Before that, let me, there is an article in Pediatrics 2015, it's an RCT on sustained lung inflation using 25 centimeters of water pressure for 15 seconds followed by nasal CPAP. And they had reported uh, very much decreased need for mechanical ventilation the first 72 hours. Any comments on that? Yeah, I, I think it's important that a number of studies are, are done, but of course, the bigger the study, the more likely you are to come, uh, you are to discover the truth. Uh, and really we need to be looking for important outcomes like death, uh, like bronchopulmonary dysplasia, not just uh, avoiding um, ventilation in the first hour or two of life. Those, this is uh, a, an intervention that cannot be blinded and is therefore susceptible to bias. So we need to be looking at, at, at hard outcomes. Oh, right. I, see, I see, see somebody's asked the, the question, what is the reason for the increased mortality in the SAIL trial and, and as, as I sort of was... Yeah, before, there is another question also regarding sustained inflation. Mohamed Salah has asked, uh, manure of the method of doing sustained infl inflation. He wants to know. I'm sorry, what was the what was Sustained the inflation, how do you do it? Okay, well, in, in this trial, it was, it was done via a mask, via a face mask. The pressure was set at, at uh, 20 centimetres of water. The sustained inflation was given for 15 seconds. The, they, the uh, clinicians then observed the baby. If there was no response, they turned the pressure up to 25 and gave another sustained inflation. But uh, as, as I've shown, this was not successful in improving outcomes for these babies. 
one Kavita Sri Kumar wants to know how do we check for lung aeration if we want to practice physiological cord clamping? Yeah. So the, the, the simplest uh, way of doing that is, is to hear the baby cry. If the baby is, is crying and, and breathing, uh, breathing well, then wait for a minute and, and then, then clamp the cord. That, that's what we would do. In that, in that video I showed you, we were using a fairly sophisticated, um, uh, a fairly sophisticated carbon dioxide detector. You can actually use the colorimetric um, strips that we use to, when we're checking for endotracheal tube um, correct placement, you can put those in before the, uh, before the face mask and if it changes color during your bag and mask ventilation, then you are getting CO2 exchange. And again, you could wait for a minute after that and you would assume that the lung is, is aerated and the pulmonary um, vasculature has, has relaxed and we're getting, um, getting blood flowing from the lungs to the heart and providing left ventricular um, preload. Okay, thank you. Now I think I'll hand over to Arvind Shanoi. Prof. Davis, there's an interesting question from Mahesh Hirnandani. He says, is there a role for pro uh, doing cord stripping in a baby who is likely to be hypotensive, say in a mother who has been having antepartum hemorrhage? So would you say stripping is only for such situations where there's possible hypotension? That's a, uh, that would make, make physiological sense. And I, I guess there is unlikely to be the, the large-scale randomized trial of babies in that in that situation to prove that it was successful. I think uh, in those circumstances, particularly if the ba baby comes out looking pale, it would be reasonable to do cord stripping on, the, on, that, on that sort of situation. There's another interesting question from Kavita Shrikumar, who says that effective face ventilation would result in a visible chest rise. So are you saying that you at least give one or two puffs see there is chest rise and then uh, provide the inflation? Is it that it would, would you say that is the right way? I didn't show you these, these data tonight, but we did a study on clinicians' ability to estimate uh, ventilation or the effectiveness of ventilation by assessing chest rise. And we asked uh, experienced um, consultant neonatologists and residents and registrars looking directly down at the baby or looking from the side at the baby and their estimates of, of whether the baby was getting a sufficient tidal volume bore no uh, relationship to what we could measure through the, uh, through the flow sensor. So uh, I'd have to say that our ability to um, diagnose effective aeration by looking at chest rise is, uh, is, is limited. Another question, uh, uh, which is uh, pretty interesting, is uh, by Tariq Rahman. What, how do you arrive at this one minute? What, what would be the optimal time for DCC? Is, is it baby variable, or just uh, do we all go by a one minute cutoff? Well, what I'm suggesting is that we, we wait one minute after the baby shows signs of effective um, ventilation or effective uh, spontaneous breathing, if, if that's the sort of baby that we're, we're looking after. The minute is, is fairly arbitrary, but we, we think that a minute is, is plenty of time if the baby has started to cry or we've administered um, mask ventilation uh, and, and seen a change in color of your colorimetric strip, or you've seen a response to the baby, then waiting a minute should be enough time for that uh, lung aeration to uh, allow the transition of circulation so that uh, it is then safe to, to uh, clamp and cut the cord. Dr. Nair, over to you. Okay. No, how to open the glow test for ineffective ventilation. There's a question like that. How to open the glow test for ineffective ventilation? Yeah. So there's the, some messages from the, uh, from the animal work. One is not to let the baby become hypoxic or to become, uh, to become cold. Uh, the other is to stimulate the baby. 
the, if we, uh, my, my approach now is to, is to gently stimulate the baby if the baby is apneic rather than put a mask straight on the face. If the baby can be stimulated to start breathing, um, then the glottis will, will open and the more mature pattern of, of the glottis being predominantly open will take over from that, that fetal pattern of having the glottis completely closed. So that's, that's what uh, I would suggest, keeping the mask off the face until you've got the baby, um, got the baby crying. Of course, if the baby is, is severely asphyxiated, um, and that happens sometimes to preterm babies, but most, most of those preterm babies will come out and cry if we give them half an opportunity or, or maybe a little bit of stimulation to get them to cry. What I think we shouldn't do is, as soon as the baby is born, put the mask on the face. I think that probably, um, probably stimulates that reflex, makes the baby apneic, and then we're trying to ventilate against the closed glottis. So allowing the baby to, to breathe first is, uh, is, is probably the way to go. Um, the other thing, I, this is a, a, a field that is rapidly changing, and we, I'm sure Ola has, has, has talked to, uh, to this group before about oxygen and the risks of oxygen in the, in the delivery room. I think probably um, there is somewhere in the middle. We don't want these babies to become hypoxic. We don't want them to have long periods in high concentrations of oxygen, but I think uh, sometimes particularly very early on in the baby's life, a little bit of supplemental oxygen to get the oxygen um, levels up has, uh, has a, an effect of helping the glottis to open and, and then the babies can be resuscitated more, more easily. Okay, I think this is another question. Cord stripping in a baby, born to a mother with antipartic hemorrhage and hypertension. Can we perform cord stripping? Yeah, I think that's the same question as, as we talked about oh, uh, okay. a, a little while ago. But yes, I, I think um, in the absence of any evidence uh, for or against that that argument, I think that's it's it's quite reasonable to um, to strip that, that baby's cord and, and then get on with the resuscitation. Okay, shall I? Prof, uh, there are, uh, based on what you said about the face mark, a uh, couple of questions were, which have asked whether you should use an LMA. Or should we use a CPAP cannula or a Argyle or a RAMS cannula in the delivery room to avoid the trigeminal cardiac reflex? What would be your take on that? Yeah, I think those are all very good suggestions. Um, to start with the LMA, there, there is some emerging evidence that the LMA is a tool in the, in the delivery room. We haven't been using that in, in my unit, but there is work coming out of particularly resource limited settings in Africa that it is a it is an effective tool and uh, we're trying to organize some larger studies uh, of LMA and that's a, that's a very good suggestion and it may have uh, may have a good place in in Indian neonatology I, I quite like the idea of an alternative to a face mask I think having uh, a face mask that people put on take off put on take off, and continually stimulating the face is probably the worst uh, interface that we could use. I quite like the idea of, of um, some nasal prongs that can be set and get our hands away from the baby, stimulate the baby, get the baby to cry, inflate their own lungs, and that's probably uh, uh, a, a good way of, of doing things. But these are, these are ideas that need testing in, in proper clinical trials. Prof, you were earlier uh, talking about why the SAIL trial failed. What would be your insights on that? Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't say it, it had failed. It, it, it's revealed some truth. So in the sense that we want tri trials to reveal the truth, it's, it's, it's done that. It, it showed yes. that at best the, the sustained inflation um, did not improve outcomes. At worst, it, it, it did increase uh, the risk of um, early mortality. So I think it was a useful trial. Why, why did it fail? It may be because of this, uh, this um, glottic closure, that the, the sustained inflation against the closed glottis, the only effect of, of doing that was um, delay effective resuscitation or maybe make, make, make the baby 
worse in that first uh, few minutes. And to, to expand on the point that I, I made uh, in the talk, it worked in lambs who were sedated and had an endotracheal tube. So they had a, a pathway to the lung. And so the glottic obstruction didn't, didn't enter, enter into it and they were sedated and, and relaxed. These babies uh, came out, um, many vigorous. Uh, you put the, the face mask on, you try and deliver a long, slow breath. That might be um, triggering the obstruction and making things worse rather than better. Prof, do we have any data? How many babies in the cell tract cried before sustained inflation was given? That might answer it. Yeah, I, we, we don't have that data. I, my impression is that people were very keen to get the mask onto the face as soon as the baby hit the, uh, hit the resuscitation trolley. So I, I, we, we, we don't have that data and I suspect we didn't give babies enough of a chance to cry. Okay. We, we have one more question on term babies. Dr. Archana Bilegi is asking, in spontaneously breathing term in infants, would it be more beneficial to wait on uh, cord clamping till the placenta separates? I, I think that, that, that would be fine. Um, within the obstetrician's comfort zone, we, we don't uh, want to be uh, making things worse from the mother's point of view. But yes, if, if it's safe for the mother to, um, to have cord uh, clamping delayed for that length of time, that's, that's, that's fine. Okay, there are two questions on uh, delayed cord clamping. One by Dr. Jatika. Timing of delayed cord clamping, one minute versus stopping of pulsations. Yeah, we, we don't know. Uh, I think I've, I've argued against the one minute rule. I think it, it probably fits most babies, but it makes more sense to consider the baby's physiology. The, um, the cord pulsations, I, I guess, uh, quite difficult to feel exactly when, when the cord pulsation stops. Sometimes they stop very quickly. Uh, and if they've stopped before the baby has, has breathed, then you'll be, you'll be cutting the cord um, too, too soon. So I would argue for timing the cord, uh, cutting and clamping to when the baby is, is through that process of aerating their lungs as, as evidenced by either uh, crying, waiting a minute or effective ventilation for a minute. Okay. If uh, there is another question again on cord clamping, if delayed cord clamping is to improve preload and decrease afterload, how does it prevent IVH? Yeah, it will, it will allow a more stable transition uh, of the circulation. As, as I've shown, if that, uh, if that preload is, is removed, there will be a period of, of decreased left ventricular output, uh, which when it recovers will rebound. So you'll go from a period of very low brain perfusion to a, a period of much higher brain perfusion. And that is the setup for intraventricular hemorrhage. If you can keep the transition smooth so that the placenta is, is functioning in, until the lungs take over, then that's more likely to give a more stable uh, hemodynamic situation, blood flowing to the brain is, is more likely to be stable and less likely to cause intraventricular hemorrhage. Okay, okay Dr. Arvind, a lot of questions are piling up. <laughs> Uh, Prof, uh, uh, there is a lot of overlap. May I just uh, summarize all of them? Uh, that e a lot of suggestions of what possible uh, sort of interface to provide CPAP or uh, respiration after birth. Do you have any suggestion? If not face marks, what else do you think would probably be the best? Yeah, I, th I think we're, we're still working on that. Um, I quite like nasal nasal prongs, but the, they are at the moment the, not well designed for just putting them in, um, strapping them behind the baby's head and, and getting our hands away from the face. So there are various companies working on, on that. We in the past have used a single nasal prong, just use a cut down endotracheal tube um, placed into the back of the nose to give CPAP. I think that worked quite well 
from the point of view of giving a stable interface, but a single prong has got high resistance, so it's not as good as, as short by nasal prongs. So this is a uh, this is a field of in evolution. I don't think we have an ideal device to to recommend at the moment. We we do the best with what we can. High flow uh, cannulae are, are another option. I think in the uh, in the delivery room needs needs evaluation, but a, a very benign and perhaps more comfortable interface for the baby and, and uh, allowing the baby to make the transition and then perhaps changing over to nasal CPAP when you need more, more distension. Prof, uh, there are a lot of questions related to the pressure. You had mentioned 30 on five and there are various questions Mohammed Amir has asked and others have also asked. What would you recommend? What pressures would you recommend for an apneic baby a preterm baby with apnea in the delivery room, how would you go about it? Yeah, we, we would start with 25 these days for a, a term baby and perhaps 20 for a preterm baby uh, and be prepared to go up. As, as you know, if the baby has not taken uh, a breath um, to aerate the lungs, then those lungs are going to be very stiff and might need pressures much higher than 25, 30, 35, 40 to uh, expand expand the lungs. So being prepared to be flexible, using the, the least amount of, of, of pressure you, you can to get that response, to get the heart rate coming up uh, is reasonable. But we, we use 25 as a starting point. There are certain questions which uh, talk about DCC and uh, this thing. Uh, Dr. Vishal Vishnu Tiwari has asked, would uh, giving doing a delayed cord clamping re result in lesser fluid a requirement of fluid resuscitation in such preterms, and some other people have talked about uh, DCC along with jaundice. Does it increase the risk of jaundice? Yeah. So both good questions. Yes, the uh, delayed cord clamping or the allowing of that uh, afterload situation to to stabilize the baby's uh, circulation and give a more stable blood pressure means that these babies are, are less likely to need either fluid or inotrope therapy in the first hours of life and that's been that's been shown in in uh, in several studies uh, the other part of that question was I'm sorry I've forgotten and there is again a more question on cord clamping is cord clamping delaying in a baby who need resuscitation has an effect on success of resuscitation success yeah. of resuscitation well this this is still I, I I'm, I'm, I apologize for um, raising ideas uh, to think about that maybe are not ready for immediate translation into, into, into everybody's delivery room. Um, I think it is uh, in the current environment, the recommendation is that we, we uh, clamp the cord and, and start resuscitation. I think to, if, if the baby needs resuscitation, so if the baby comes out and is floppy and white and not breathing, then delaying cord clamping and not providing respiratory support is probably the worst thing to do. Um, you either start resuscitation with the baby still attached to the cord, that's what we're experimenting with and what we hope will prove to be the, the more successful uh, way, or you clamp the cord and you start to provide positive pressure ventilation when you get the baby to the resuscitator. So do it, do it more quickly. But either way, that baby needs needs help. Okay. Adam, uh, is there any role of gravity? Because some of the uh, questions are, should the, should the baby be lower than the mother when DCC is being done? Is that better or should it be higher? Yeah, I, the, the work that's been done suggests that the, the position doesn't matter. You would think that having the baby lower would encourage more flow from the, from the placenta to the baby, but uh, I think it's work coming out of uh, South America suggests that that did not have, a, have an appreciable effect on, on um, postnatal haemoglobin or postnatal weight. Any contraindications to D uh, DCC? Somebody has asked about IUGR babies and things like that. Uh, would you think of any? I can't think of a, a, a reason to delay cord clamping in, in a specific subgroup of babies. They, uh, the more vulnerable the baby, probably the more likely they are to benefit from um, delayed cord clamping. I remember now that one of the questions was about jaundice. And yes, there is a risk 
if the baby gets more blood from the delayed cord clamping has a higher hematocrit and that subsequently breaks down to uh, produce more um, bilirubin therefore makes the jaundice worse. There is some evidence for that um, in a uh, in most settings where phototherapy is available, that's a, that's a problem that can be solved easily. It doesn't really um, impact on the baby's long term um, long term welfare. We still have some concerns about what it might mean in uh, developing countries where um, where phototherapy might not be available and jaundice might be a, a more significant problem but uh, at the moment the, the the weight of evidence favors delayed cord clamping michelle tubari has asked again uh, this well does dcc lead to lesser requirement of fluid resuscitation and need for inotrope in the first 72 hour in pre uh yes yes i believe it does it's not a it's not a um completely overwhelming effect, but there is a reduction in hemodynamic instability in the first 24 hours at least uh, if you use delayed cord clamping rather than immediate cord clamping. Okay. Is there any scope of modifying continuing research on sustained lung inflation? And Prashant has asked this question. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, it's very difficult to do research once you've um, discovered that the intervention that you thought was good is associated with an increased death rate, albeit in, in the first uh, two days of life, not, not overall. Um, we would have to think of modifying that uh, intervention or choosing a different subgroup of babies, delivering the, the sustained inflation in, an, in another way. Um, and I, I think the appetite to do that is probably going to be small. On the other hand, uh, other people have proposed a more gentle form of uh, aeration of the lung, a, a, a titrating of the end expiratory pressure. So putting that up quite high in the first, um, in the first minutes of life to try and more gently uh, inflate the lungs and that there is a randomized trial planned to investigate that intervention. Um, th th those, those are the only things I'm aware of uh, in terms of going back to trying to try and find a, a modification of a sustained inflation. Another question, sustained inflation, what is the PEEP used? Dr. Devi Kiran wants to know. What was so, so, the PEEP, PEEP used? So the sustained inflation was, was given at initially at 20 centimetres of water, and then the baby was given intermittent positive pressure ventilation with a, a PEEP of five, so 20 over five. Uh, and then if that didn't work, the second sustained inflation, 25, and then when intermittent uh, ventilation was provided, 25 on five. Is there any change in practice of DCC for tune delivery? Tune delivery, is there any change in practice of delayed cord cramping? That's a good question. I'm not, I'm not aware of uh, recommendations specific to twins, but uh, that's a very good question. And Dr. Arun, please. Prof, there are some questions regarding the use of uh, echo. You use that to uh, uh, determine uh, the heart rate. But uh, on uh, review of those echocardiograms, were you able to come out with any physiological data which may help, uh, you know, refute or confirm what you have been, what we have been studying in labs. Yeah, the, the views uh, in, in those echoes were not sufficient to make calculations on um, uh, ventricular output or cardiac output. Um, the the use of, of echo to, to measure heart rate, I think, has been superseded. There are now ECG um, electrodes that can be easily placed and, and give a, a rapid uh, a rapid heart rate without needing to get the big machine in there. But uh, we had a very keen fellow uh, who was uh, liked, liked to use the ultrasound machine and uh, bring it into the delivery room. And he, he did, did that for a few babies. But these days we would be using the, uh, an ECG to, to measure heart rates. Should the DCC be performed in IUGR babies? Intra-trained growth-restricted babies. 
I, I don't see any reason why not. Um, I, I, I can't see that uh, there would be they would be at greater risk of, of problems from delayed cord clamping. I, it, uh, I don't think those that group of babies has been looked at in the randomised trial specifically. Perhaps they should be, but I'm not aware of any contraindication. Yes, uh, Adam. I think we have covered most of it. There is a repetition in terms of the questions. Uh, I think we can uh, uh, sort of ask Prof to, if you'd like to summarize and- One more thing is, one question is the risk of dislodging clots and thrombus with cord stripping. Yeah, well, that, the people have, have, have made the points both for and against cord stripping about what you might milk along with the, the red cells. They, some people say it's great, you'll be milking some stem cells into the baby and, and that will uh, that will do the, the prem babies good. Others have been worried about clots. I, I'm not aware of, uh, of, of clots being a, being a, a problem in, in uh, babies who have had cord milking, but it's a, it's a reasonable question. Okay. And uh, maybe the last question, does Elcor going to include this caveat of closed glottis? <laughs> closed glottis. Does cord clamping change the, the glottic closure? No, Elcor, Elcor going to, Elcor maybe, International Liaison Committee, oh, sorry, going yeah, to include this caveat of closed glottis. Well, there's a lot of uh, new data coming through and, and ILCOR will, will try and incorporate that in, in ongoing um, recommendations. But I, th I think what I've shown you tonight really just talks about the problem. We don't have the solutions as I've, I've had been forced to confess when, when you've asked me the questions. But the first, the first uh, step in overcoming these problems and making resuscitation better is to understand the the physiology and to understand the things that are going going wrong uh, in the in the delivery room. And this is one example of of something that we were not expecting, uh, and and we need to think about it and think about ways of uh, of getting around that problem. And there are a lot of still more a lot of questions, but most are repetitions. I think we can. Summarize. Uh, just one uh, new something has come up. Some of the questions now coming are on uh, uh, RH incompatibility. Is it a contraindication for uh, DCC as well as babies with Doppler abnormalities? Would you say DCC is contraindicated? Mm. Um, I'll have to get back to you on the rhesus, uh, the rhesus incompatibility. I, I'm not aware of any specific recommendations against using uh, delayed cord clamping, but it's a good question. I, I would need to check on that. Um, antenatally diagnosed uh, problems with Doppler flows, I, I don't think that's a, uh, that's a, a contraindication. And what is the minimum gestational age to resuscitate? It? Nothing to do with cord clamping. Mohammed Amir wants to know what is the minimum gestational age to resuscitate. It's it's a moving it's a moving target, and uh, we have moved fairly recently to saying that we would resuscitate all babies above twenty four weeks. Um, between twenty two and twenty four weeks uh, is the zone of of parental discretion where we would discuss the uh, the potential outcomes at, at that gestation and with discussion with the parents come up with a, a consensus on whether we should intervene or not. But we are, we are certainly resuscitating babies down into the 22nd week of life. Prof, uh, Dr. Bunsell wants to ask an interesting question. He says, from your presentation, the concept seems to be, it makes an impression that circulation is more important than ventilation in neonates because DCC is uh, is on and resuscitation, there's no benefit in SI. Uh, would you like to respond? No, I'm, I apologize if I've, if I've given that, that impression. I think ventilation is the key to success. And that's, uh, I think that's something we should maybe, uh, maybe close on. Um, I think deferred cord clamping or even physiological cord clamping makes the transition smoother. But for babies who need resuscitation, so the apneic baby, the baby who's born in the setting of an abruption or severe infection, 
who is not not breathing uh, at birth, the solution is ventilation, uh, not not cord clamping. For the vast majority of babies, the the ninety five percent of babies who who come out and cry either by themselves or with a little bit of stimulation, delayed cord clamping very important. But for those those sick babies that we see, uh, you know, every week in our delivery rooms, the pale, the grey, the apneic babies. These babies' uh, ventilation is is the key to success. Wonderful. I I I would like to thank you, Prof. I think you're doing an excellent job. Uh, over to you, Dr. Nair. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a wonderful job you have done, especially so many about hundred questions are there. <laughs> All you have tried to answer in a very good way. Thank you, Prof. Sir. It's been it's been my pleasure. Uh, I've I've really enjoyed <laughs> meeting you all and uh, hello to any of my Indian friends who are online. Uh, I I hope we can all see each other in person sometime uh, in the not too far distant uh, future. I wish you all the best uh, getting through this crisis um, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Professor. Thank you. Over to Manoj. Thank you, sir. That is a fabulous session. And uh, as usual, your sessions, it's a pleasure to hear you talk. So uh, now uh, we will have, I, I would request my colleague, Dr. Vishu Mohan, to propose the official vote of thanks. Before that, uh, let me just uh, thank uh, two of the uh, legends uh, uh, in our series who are there with us uh, right now, uh, Professor Dr. Ola and Professor Dr. Satyan. Thank you, sirs. Now, Dr. over to Dr. Vishnu. Respected teachers, seniors, and my dear friends, on behalf of the IP Neocha, NF Kerala, and IEP Trishu, from the bottom of my heart, I thank Professor Dr. Peter Graham Davis, one of the legends in our field, for accepting our invitation and being with us today. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Ola and Dr. Satin, Dr. Satin Lakshmi Narasimha for their presence uh, for the webinar today. Thank you, sirs. With great happiness, I thank Professor Dr. PMC Nair, one of the first neonatologists from our state, Kerala. Sir has been a guiding light for almost everyone practicing neonatology in our state. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. Arvind Chennai, another of our own legends, Thank you, sir, for being with us today and moderating the session. We had, till today evening, almost 1,959 registrations from 36 different countries. And we had near to 750 people attending our webinar today. Thank you, all dear delegates, for attending the webinar today and making the webinar a success. It wouldn't have been a success without your presence. And last but not the least, I thank my dear team at Trishul, Team IAP Neocon 2020, for all the hard work put together in the background. Thank you all. Our next webinar is on the 21st of July at 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time by none other than Dr. Professor Le Le Satyan Lakshmi Narasimha. He'll be speaking to us on PPHN management. What can the features teach us? Looking forward to meeting you all again on 21st. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>